Good morning. Lots of sunshine today. It's probably a good thing if all of you are sitting over on the west side, because if you were sitting over here, you wouldn't see a thing. <laughs> it's so bright. Will you join in our first song found in the Chalice Hymnal on page 621? Are ye able? And we're going to sing verses 1 and 3. Please stand. moment to look at the announcements on the back of your bulletin. We have those wonderful people that cannot be with us to pray for today. Uh, please keep them in your prayers. Is there anyone that needs to be added to our prayer list that we may have missed? The proctors are still missing, yes, and they need to be forefront on our prayers. And of course, we pray for those who suffer in silence, that they may feel our prayers. Uh, Wednesday is youth group at 2 p.m. And each Wednesday also at the PUCC church uh, is the chosen Bible study, which starts at 6.30. <coughs> then a rehearsal will begin on February 5th at 1 p.m. at the Aurora United Methodist Church. Um, we are going to have a um, cantata. Haven't had one in several years, and this is very exciting. So uh, keep that in mind, and um, if you can join, please do. Uh, the cantatas are so much fun. There's so much laughter that goes on at practice. You wouldn't believe it. Any other announcements that need to be made? For those of you who might be interested, the 14th of February, which is Valentine's Day, uh, the Senior Center is having a Valentine's Day supper, and uh, tickets are available. We're serving prime rib. And so, if men, you would like to take your ladies out, but you don't want to leave town, this is a good place to go. Let me know if you'd like tickets. Will you join in the call to worship? You came down to save a lost world in sin and only require one thing in return. We have decided to follow Jesus. You have told us that in this world you will, we will have trials, struggles, and hardships. But to take heart, 
you have overcome the world. We have decided to follow Jesus. You have promised a glorious home and crown that awaits for all who in faith have accepted you as their Lord and Savior. We have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Our next hymn is found on page 452 in the Chalice Hymnal. join in the congregational prayer found in your bulletin as we pray together. Gracious and most merciful Father, you hear the groanings of our souls. You know the struggles we face and the weight that is in our minds and on our hearts. You told us that it would not be easy, assured us that you had already overcome the darkness and the trouble of this world. When you ask us to take up our cross and follow you, the riches that await are far greater than anything this world could offer. Give us peace and courage to boldly step out in faith and obedience to follow you whatever the cost knowing that your gift of eternal salvation is the reward. Amen. I was looking for something for offering, and I found something on perspective, what I thought would fit very nicely here. And it's Jesus talking to us when he says, I am with you. These four words are like a safety net, protecting you from falling into despair because you are human. You will always have ups and downs in your life experience, but the promise of my presence limits just how far down you go. Sometimes you may feel as if you are in a free fall, 
when people or things you had counted on let you down. Yet as soon as you remember that I am with you, your perspective changes radically. Instead of bemoaning your circumstances, you can look to me for help. You recall that not only am I with you, I am holding you by your right hand. I guide you with my counsel, and afterward, I will take you into glory. This is exactly the perspective we need. The reassurance of his promise and his presence and the glory of hope of heaven. Will the deacons come forward, please? Father, help us to remember through these offerings that, that we bring to you that we love you and we want to do your work here on earth. Please take us by our right hand. Guide us and direct us to make sure that your kingdom is here on earth. Amen. You may be seated. This one, what is this one? This is the airplane. Oh, 
Alex, what does it say on the left? Sammy. Jesus. Okay, we're going to put Jesus right there. And what does it say on the back of the airplane? God. Wow. <laughs> Look how much better that puzzle looks. It doesn't have holes, does it? Okay, you think we can find the dinosaur now? I got him in this pocket. Okay, so now I'm going to take the dinosaur.
So we'll probably be doing something around two, two, three o'clock, whatever works for people. And we might do it at the PUCC just because we get so much light coming in through these windows, it's hard to see. So anyway, we will get that email out to let everybody know. So we're going to be looking today at the scriptures from Matthew. And this is what Jesus was talking about in chapter 16, your verse that you can put up on your mirror for this week. Is that Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. 24 comes from a wider passage. We're going to start with verse 21. From the time Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and the scribes, and to be killed and to be raised on the third day, then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, For far be it from me, Lord, that it shall happen to you. But Jesus turned to him and said, Get behind me, Satan. You are in offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of man. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what profit is it of a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own life? Or what will a man give? in exchange for his soul. For the Son of Man will come in glory of his Father and his angels, and then he will reward each according to his works. Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they have seen the Son of Man coming to his kingdom. Thus ends the reading. Thanks be to God. Well, today I got to play in the bells over at Messiah, so that was fun, and I was all done in my black. But see, here's the thing. I found this t-shirt at the store, and I thought, well, I've got my title for today, for the sermon. I thought it worked pretty perfect. It says, hang on, let me overthink this. Am I the only one sitting in this room that does that quite often? Well, let me ask you, if you have ever... Um, been given a task and you couldn't even move because you were so busy thinking about all the possibilities and everything you should do and what you could do, you're an overthinker. You know, don't feel bad. You're not the only one. The men and women in this packet were just like you. Along with a lot of the Old Testament characters too. That's the next thing I'm going to be doing is putting together a booklet of all the main characters in the Old Testament, who they are, what they did a little bit, so that way it's easier to go back and look. There's a lot of people who overthought stuff. I think we can go back as far back as Moses. When Moses asked him at the burning bush, he was going to send him back, what did Moses do? He immediately started thinking of all the reasons why he couldn't go back and why he was not the one that God should be choosing. And how about Gideon? When God called Gideon as a judge and he called him to go and defeat the enemy, what did Gideon say? Uh, can I ask for a sign? And then when God gave him the sign, what did he say? Don't be mad, can I ask for a second sign? I think we can relate to that. Or how about Samson? When given the rules, did everything he could to not comply with the rules, but to overthink it. Well, we see as we get into the New Testament, as Jesus comes on the scene, we have all these wonderful men and women who were touched by him from the very beginning. You know, one could argue the very first disciple of Jesus was his mother Mary. She was the very first one that knew that Jesus was going to be the Messiah along with his father, Joseph. Can you imagine carrying that thought with you your whole life? What if when you had a child that was born, God had told you something so miraculous, so stupendous, 
that you couldn't, your little brain couldn't hardly even comprehend it. And then you had to carry that burden with you your whole life. And you couldn't tell anyone. This is Mary pondered all these things in her heart. I'm sure she was overthinking a lot of stuff. When will I know? What's he going to be like? Is he going to be different than the other kids? And then when he wasn't, and he was human, did she start overthinking? Did I hear that right? <laughs> I'm sure it wasn't from bad pizza. I am sure an angel came. And I am sure an angel came and, and told me all these things. And the shepherd showed up and the wise men showed up. So I know I'm not crazy. I know I'm not making this up. So she pondered all this in her heart. It wasn't until fast forward to when he was 12. And he stayed behind in Jerusalem at the temple. And they couldn't find him. Well, they were overthinking a lot of stuff. They were panicking. And when they found him, he said, did you not know that I would be in my father's house and about my father's business? Oh, there it was. Twelve years of going, when will we know? And then the day happened. Now we're going to fast forward again. Jesus becomes about 30 years of age. And he starts his journey. The journey that God had set out for him to do from the very beginning. A journey to not just him to the cross, that was the ultimate goal, but it was the lives that he was going to touch in between point A and point B. Now there was another man who probably overthought a lot of stuff. He would be the cousin to Jesus. He's actually, I think, on the back page of that, towards the bottom. Who was John? Or who was Jesus' cousin? John the Baptist. That's right. I am sure John's folks were overthinking a lot of things too. <laughs> when the angel came to Zechariah and said, Your wife, even though she's old, is going to have a baby. And then John comes on the scene, and he is filled with the Spirit, and he goes out, and he is preparing the way of the Lord. So he's been a long talking about his cousin. Now he is preparing the way for the Messiah. He knows in his heart who Jesus is. And he gets these disciples to start following him. And he is preaching, and he is baptizing. And he is calling, repent, <laughs> make straight the paths of the desert. It was an old prophecy from Isaiah. He didn't just come up with that. He was preparing for Christ's ministry. Now, John the Baptist had a bunch of disciples, but there was two in particular that had been with John from the beginning. Do you know who they were? Well, they would be on page one at the top. You can put them in chronological order for you, kind of. That would be Philip. Philip was actually, he was from the area of, well, he was right there by Bethsaida. He was right there by where Peter and Andrew would have grown up. But he had followed John the Baptist from the very beginning. He was one of the most devout followers. And then there was another one, Andrew. And who was Andrew? Simon Peter's brother, right? They were the sons of Jonah. And they were fishermen. That's what they did for a living. It wasn't anything glamorous. It was what paid the bills. It's what put food in their mouths. They went out on the Sea of Galilee and fished every day. Not thinking that anything miraculous was really going to happen in their lives. But Andrew finds John the Baptist, and he's going with him, and he's listening to all this stuff, and he's getting excited. He's feeling the Spirit move, because John keeps talking about the Messiah, like not like a prophecy, but like he's coming, like any time he could be coming. And then one day it happens. John is baptizing down at the Jordan, and Jesus walks by. And he stops what he's doing, and he looks up, and he makes sure everybody has his attention, and he says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Oh, man, you talk about a mic drop. If a pin could drop. And who heard? Who 
hurt in their soul? Out of all those disciples that were following me, John, it was two. It was Philip and it was Andrew who dropped everything and sought out Jesus. It says Andrew comes running back to his brother. He says, we have seen the Messiah. <laughs> we have seen the one that John's been talking about. And then from there, it starts trickling down to all the men and women that Jesus touched. But see, here's the thing. They could have overthought all of that. You know, even while well, they, were, they were with John, you know, and Peter, and not Peter, but Andrew and, and Philip, when they heard John say those words, they could have started in their mind going, really? Is it, it's too true to be good, right? Or too good to be true. I've been up since one thirty. <laughs> See, we're thinking it. They could have come up with every reason why Jesus wasn't the Messiah. But they didn't. And why? Because they didn't let their brains take over what the Spirit was telling their heart. I want you to think about this in your life. Did you have a time where you felt like God was pushing you into a direction, but this got in the way? You felt led, you felt compelled to do something, yet your brain was telling you all the reasons why it would not work, why it could not work, and why it just wouldn't. I know I've had that. I love my father dearly, but it's my kid's calling. He's a dream crusher. Don't go with him with any dream of yours, because he'll tell you every reason why it won't work. And when we do that, we allow that to get in here. We start overthinking everything. But here's the thing. If it's of God, if the Spirit is moving you to do that, it will fall into place. The doors that need to be open will be open. The windows need to be open if the door is shut. <laughs> we'll open. Do you think back to all these men and women? We talk about the twelve. Because the twelve is what they mentioned. But they also, the Bible is full of all of the other men and women who followed him that didn't land in that twelve. Do you know how many were on top of that mountain when Jesus ascended into heaven? There was over 300 people. 300 people that had been with him from start to finish. Even past the death. Even the overthinking of it is over. We have followed the wrong guy. To the resurrection. To his appearance. To them staying with him for another 40 days. Before he ascended. You didn't think about that. 300 people thought with this and not with this. They didn't overthink it. And it was those same people that went out into the world when he commissioned them. And he said, go out and make what? Make disciples of all nations and baptize them and what? In the name of the Father. The name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. See, when you have those three in order, <laughs> in here, you don't have to overthink it. You don't have to try to make something happen because it's a, if it's of God, it will happen. You know, last week we talked about the patience and the timing. And I said, why is it we always say, you know, if only I had a crystal ball. If only I knew what was going to happen. If only, if only. Well, here's the thing. If we knew what was going to happen, we would try to grab the bull by the horns and run with it ourselves. We would try to help make it happen. To make it happen faster and in the way we thought it should go. And that may not be anywhere close to the route to the journey that God had in store from the very beginning. If every single one of his disciples knew the end, they would have missed all that glorious journey of the three years that Jesus took them on, the 
good, the bad, the hard, the trying, the times when they were overthinking what they asked. What do you mean by this? That's probably one of the biggest questions in the Gospels. <laughs> we don't understand. What do you mean by this? We don't get it. Explain it. They would have missed all that if they jumped from point A to point B without having the journey in between. So my challenge to you is this week when you go home, I know there's something on your heart or on your mind that you've been thinking about a lot. There is something that's stirring. Maybe you've been overthinking a little bit. Take that time to be patient, to give it to God, and to ask Him, what's the journey in between all of this going to look like? And be excited. Quit thinking with this start thinking with this because that will make everything a lot simpler. We come to Christ's feast. We come because our heart leads us. We come remembering the night in which he sat with those twelve chosen. For one last time. He lifted up the loaf and he gave thanks. 
thanks and he blessed it and he broke it. And he said, this is now my body, which is broken for you. Every time you eat of this, do this in remembrance of me. And then he picked up the cup a little later in the meal, the cup of redemption. And he gave thanks and he blessed it. But this time he said, this is going to be a new covenant. A covenant between myself and you it will be my blood, which will be poured out for the forgiveness of all sin. Every time you drink of this, do this in remembrance of me. And so as his continued followers, as the body of Christ, we come, not because we're overthinking it, because our heart compels us to take these elements, these tangible elements, and make them be to us, his body and his blood, the gift of redemption. Amen. If you would join with me in our next hymn. As I have decided to follow Jesus. We're going to do the first and the fourth verse in our chalice, page 344. Mm -hmm.
The next time you feel God's nudge to go in a direction, I challenge you to resist the urge to say, hang on, let me overthink this. Instead, do like the disciples and say, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. May you go in the love of the Father, the peace of His Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, now and forever.